I invite you to keep your Bibles open to Ephesians. As we pray together this morning and get started looking at this passage from chapter 4. Father, as we open the book of Ephesians this morning, and as we consider the ways in which the gospel shapes our lives and our relationships in this community of faith, we pray that you would bless us with wisdom, that you would give us eyes to see what you have to show us this morning and ears to hear your voice. We pray, Lord, that we would be reminded of the great hope that we have in the gospel, in the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, and that we would be transformed by it. We ask all these things in his name. Amen. Well, back in the early 2000s, some of you may remember, there was a TV show that had a pretty big following, and I was part of that following. I really loved to watch the show with my family. It was called Lost. It was a pretty crazy show with lots of twists and turns, but at the most fundamental level, it was the story of a group of people who were stranded on an island in the South Pacific after a plane crash. They found themselves marooned on this little island, and they had to figure out how to survive, And as their supplies began to run out pretty early on in the first season, they began to realize that rescuers were not coming for them, and they started fighting with one another, accusing one another of eating more than their fair share of food or whatever. The fragile group dynamic that had formed was falling apart already, very early on. And in a memorable moment, one of the characters stood up and said to everyone there in that little group of survivors, if we don't learn to live together... We are going to die alone. He understood that they had a better chance of survival if they worked together and helped one another and didn't devolve into an every man for himself mindset. It's a memorable and catchy line that was part of the reason that so many people loved that show. And it's also relevant in situations beyond surviving on a deserted island. A football or basketball team that works together is more likely to win games than a team where every player has his own plan. A factory will only be able to turn out products if if the people that work there are working together to do their part, not just whatever they feel like doing on a daily basis. A military unit is more more likely to succeed if the soldiers in it have a single strategy rather than a hundred different battle plans. But this message, I think, is particularly important for the church, for Christians, For God's people around the world and throughout the generations in local gatherings, just like Westgate, unity is a necessity. The stakes could not possibly be higher. A basketball team risks losing games if they don't work together. A factory risks losing profits if they don't cooperate. A military force risks victory and even the lives of its members if they are are not united and moving forward together. But the church risks losing sight of of the gospel. It is not an overstatement to say that apart from healthy Christian fellowship, faith will not survive. Instead, it will wither, and the gospel will eventually appear less and less wonderful. From the very beginning, God intended that people would live and work together from the moment that He said it was not good for Adam to be alone in the garden. And even though there is no church in existence that isn't full of sinners, we put ourselves in peril when we decide we'd rather go it alone. As we begin a new year together here at Westgate, we're taking some time to review our core commitments, the initiatives that we as a church have devoted ourselves to. Our core commitments are not questions of doctrine or theology, but they are derived from our theological convictions, and they give shape to our life as a church family. They are our biblically governed strategy for accomplishing our mission of seeing Christ treasured above all things here in Metro West Boston and around the world. And it is good to remind ourselves of these things that we have committed ourselves to, to reaffirm them and to begin this new year aspirationally, hoping to see God bring these things about in our midst. So even though I'm not a guy who's really big on New Year's resolutions, I guess that's sort of what we're doing as we kick off 2023 together. And this morning, We're beginning with Christ-centered community, recognizing both why it is essential and how we are blessed by it. And here in this passage from Ephesians 4, we see the significance of fellowship for God's people. Ephesians was written at the end of Paul's life from Rome, where he is imprisoned and awaiting his own death sentence. He's writing to friends that he made 10 years earlier in the town of Ephesus, where he spent two years 
living and teaching and preaching the gospel. Ephesus was an incredibly important city. It was built next to a natural harbor on the Aegean Sea, and it was at the western end of lots of overland trade routes that extended well into Asia. So it was the hub of lots of shipping and trade. And because of that, it became both exceedingly wealthy and very diverse. It was at the crossroads of ancient trade, and so Ephesus became a true melting pot with residents from all over the known world. Each of them brought with them to Ephesus their own cultures and religious beliefs, so Ephesus was also home to lots and lots of temples to various gods from far-flung places. But trade didn't just bring people to the city, it also brought lots and lots of money to the city. So each temple that dotted the city skyline was more impressive than the last, but none more so than the famed Temple of Artemis, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world and was built in Ephesus. When it was destroyed by a fire, the diverse and wealthy city that was so proud of this massive temple, they refused to accept money from Alexander the Great to rebuild it. Alexander the Great thought it was a tragedy that the temple of Artemis had burned to the ground. It was such a spectacle. He wanted to see it rebuilt, and he offered to, to give funding to help make it happen. But the people of Ephesus, they refused to receive that money. Instead, they paid for it themselves because it was such an extravagantly wealthy city that it was well within their means to build it all over again. The story of the temple of Artemis paints a picture of a city that was made up of a very diverse group of people, united by a skill for making and spending lots of money. Paul knew that situation very well. He understood the challenges that were represented by preaching the gospel there, and he also understood the strategic importance of that city. That if a healthy church was established there, it had the potential to reach distant shores with the message of Christianity. And so he spent more than two years living there, and now... A decade later, he's writing to to them in the hope that the church there will remain a vibrant and committed congregation long after his own time on earth is through. The first three chapters of this book are a review of the gospel itself. The fact that all people were dead in sin, but but in grace, God has made us alive together with His Son. Paul spends half of this book grounding the Ephesian church in the core of Christianity, reminding them that it is not their commitments as a church that will endear them to God. It is the loving sacrifice of Christ on their behalf that does that. They were dead, not struggling with sin, but dead in it, unable to do anything else when God intervened and called them to life. It isn't, first and foremost, a list of instructions for the Ephesians to follow. That's sometimes the way that people think about the Bible or Christianity in general, that it boils down essentially to a set of rules, a lifestyle that forbids certain things and requires others. But these first three chapters of Ephesians show us that Paul is not all about giving instructions or demanding a certain lifestyle. He's just reminding these people of the good news that God has called them to, that He has called them out of their graves and into a new life. But that's not to say that there are not instructions in this book. In fact, there are 41 imperatival commands from Paul to the Ephesian church in this short letter. So it's not hard to understand why some people think that Christianity is really just about rules. Ephesians isn't very long, and there are 41 instructions here. But it's important to see that 40 of those 41 instructions are in the second half of the book. All but one of them are in the second half of the book. Paul knows, and he's teaching these believers in Ephesus, that the Christian life flows out of the gospel. God's grace is the basis on which the Christian life is built. After spending three chapters expounding on the gospel itself, Paul says, therefore, in chapter 4, verse 1. It's the turning point of the whole book, after which he gives instructions about how specifically the gospel changes our lives. In fact, that's his whole point in chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. 
in light of the gospel, or because God has called you out of the graveyard of your sin, I urge you to walk in a worthy way. Walk is a pretty typically Pauline way of just referring to living your life. He has more in mind than the way that Christians carry themselves on Sunday mornings in church. Paul goes on to explain specifically how the gospel changes marriage, parenthood, work, and the use of authority, among lots of other things. It changes everything from the way that you use your downtime to the way that you handle conflict. For Paul, the gospel has turned his life completely upside down. He went from a persecutor of Christianity to a missionary carrying its message to every town that he visited. He went from respected theological authority in Judaism to imprisoned in Rome for the sake of Christ. At first, the fact that he mentions that he is a prisoner of the Lord here in verse 1 seems a little bit like a non sequitur. But I think he's subtly reminding the Ephesians that worthiness of our calling is not always measured in dollars and cents. Worthiness to the calling of God may mean turning away from lucrative opportunities. It may mean letting go of lives of worldly esteem and honor in exchange for lives of simplicity and service and even suffering. It may mean accepting imprisonment in Rome for the sake of telling people about the death and resurrection of the Son of God. For the Ephesians, like the rich young ruler who came asking Jesus what, it was, what was necessary for him to inherit eternal life, relinquishing wealth and the lives uh, of, of, of riches and big houses and plush lifestyles for lives that are considerably less glamorous will be a challenge. But Paul urges them to consider the gospel, that they have been brought from death to life by the sacrificial love of Christ for them, and to let the full weight and glory of that hope transform their hearts. It's similar to what he wrote in Philippians 1.27, where he encouraged believers in Philippi to let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. Rather than striving for righteousness before God, Christians recognize that we are counted righteous already, and that the lives we live now are our joyful response. So, Paul's instructions and commands about how to go about the Christian life, very importantly, come after he reminds these friends of his of the gospel. And even though Paul is going to get into all kinds of ways that the gospel shapes the lives of God's people, the very first thing he addresses is the fellowship of those people. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling, he says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. It's possible that Paul saw this as a uniquely important priority for the Ephesian church, since it was composed of such a diverse group of people. Believers in Ephesus were from both Jewish and Gentile backgrounds. They included both rich merchants and poor laborers, Roman citizens and non-citizens, and probably a handful of foreigners from distant places who had made their home in the city. These were not people who would otherwise have had much reason to hang out together, much less serve and love one another like a family. In the ancient world, there was not a generally congenial attitude among people. Unlike today, diversity was not something that people sought out. Groups with this sort of eclectic mixture of background just did not exist. So there was probably more of a chance that the congregation in Ephesus would never really come together, but would forever exist as a, a set of smaller groups of people who really did not have much in common. It's possible that the reason Paul, without even starting a new sentence from verses 1 and into 2, without even starting a new sentence, moves from urging the Ephesians to live a life according to the truth of the gospel, to talking about the unity of the church, it's possible that the reason he does that is because this is a fragmented church. Ephesians, unlike so many of Paul's letters, does not contain any explanation for exactly why he's writing. There's not some major sin struggle happening in Ephesus or the influence of false teachers that these people are dealing with and Paul is stepping in to help them deal with. 
But maybe he knows how precarious the community of faith in Ephesus really was, having spent two years of his life there. So he encourages these friends of his to eagerly maintain the unity that they have, to protect it. And he gives four specific strategies for doing that. Humility, gentleness, patience, and loving forbearance. The church in Ephesus will not thrive because of a growth strategy or an innovative program. It will, carry, it will not carry out its mission to reach the city and the world because of slick marketing and a polished worship service that people will flock to. What this church needs, what Paul knows this church needs, and what every church needs, is a community that is formed by the gospel and which expresses the gospel in the way that it acts. Paul makes that point emphatically, sort of a fourfold repetition of the heart of Christ, four attributes that flow directly from the heart of Christ, who was humble, willing to make himself low and become the servant of all, even though he rules over the heavens of the earth and ought to be served by all. He was humble enough to come into the world to take on flesh so that it could be scarred and crucified for the salvation of his people. He was gentle. The word Paul uses here in verse 2 is elsewhere translated as meekness. My Greek dictionary defines this word as the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance, which I love. Nobody likes it when somebody is overly impressed with themselves. But if there is anybody in the history of the world who would have been justified in it, it is Jesus Christ. Jesus remembered the day that He formed the heavens and the earth. He knew the power that was in His hands to hold them together. He remembered the day that He formed mankind out of dust, and He remembered well the day that mankind invited calamity and disorder and wickedness into His good creation. His wrath was rightly stoked for the evil things that he saw humanity carry out against one another. But rather than turning the world into a pile of ash under that wrath, he was gentle enough to wash the feet of his disciples, preparing them for the ultimate sign of his gentleness when he laid down his life to save theirs. He was patient with those who struggled with doubt and unbelief and stumbled in their faith. Even though his invisible attributes are visible in the works of creation, Paul writes in Romans 1, so that all people around the world are without an excuse to know and honor God, Christ was willing in the incarnation, in his life and death and resurrect resurrection, to reveal with crystal clarity the depths of his glory and to invite people to behold it. So when a man stands before him and says, I believe, help my unbelief, Jesus was not irritated with him. He did not rebuke this man that the spark of faith in his life was not a raging inferno. He was patient and he showed him the truth by casting a demon out of the man's son. He showed loving mercy to those who failed to honor him. When Peter the disciple who said that he would sooner die than betray or abandon Jesus denied even knowing him out of fear that being associated with Jesus would put him in danger. Jesus did not cast him out, but forgave him and received him again into the fellowship of the disciples. Jesus does not withhold forgiveness, but delights to show mercy. Humility and gentleness and patience and loving forbearance are the heart of Christ for His church, and that heart ought to shape the community within the church. For a church community to thrive, it needs to know Jesus, to really know Him and His humble, merciful heart for them, and to be so captivated by it that they begin to reflect that humble, merciful love to one another. That only happens when the gospel is preached clearly when the people in a community of faith like this one are pouring over the words of Scripture and the Holy Spirit is at work to bring the gospel to bear on the lives of the people in that church. And even though this message was particularly relevant for the Ephesian congregation, fragmented as it evidently was, it is equally important for all churches, including this one. Because 
even though God is sanctifying his people, making them look more and more like Christ, sin remains. If it didn't, we would not be we would not need to be reminded to be humble. We would not need to be reminded to show one another grace or to act with patience toward one another. This word from Paul in Ephesians 4 is a sobering reminder of the fact that the church is not a perfect place because we make it imperfect. We are the reason that patience is necessary in this room and that forgiveness is a daily requirement. That is true here at Westgate, and it's true at every church. Sin remains even among people who hate it and resist it. Pride and selfishness and egos that demand to be honored are the instinct of our hearts, and Paul knows that, and he knows that left unchecked, that instinct will destroy the community of God's people. So he says, walk in a manner that is worthy of your calling. Live under the gospel. Rest in the light of the love of God for you. Knowing that Christ was humble for your sake, humble yourself for the sake of your brethren. Knowing that Christ was gentle with you, that He became your servant and did not cling to His throne, but laid aside the honor due to Him in order to wash not just your feet, but your guilt away from you, be gentle toward your brothers and sisters, loving them like He does. Knowing that He is patient with you, carrying you when you stumble in your faith and struggle with doubt, be patient with the people in this room who struggle just like you do. And even though every one of us still struggles with sin every day, He delights to show us mercy because of His endless loving forbearance for us. So how could we possibly consider withholding forgiveness from one another who labor against the same sin? In every wedding that I've ever officiated, I've always made sure to explain to both the bride and the groom that their marriage must be and absolutely must be carried out this way. I turn to the groom and I tell him that he must remember that no matter how much your bride might sin against you, it is small compared to the multitude of your sin that is against a holy God and has already been forgiven in Christ. And then I'll turn to the bride and I will tell her the same thing. No matter how much he sins against you, remember that it is small compared to the, the mass of sin that God has already forgiven you of. As Christians, we are free from the burden of holding grudges of being divided from one another. We've been forgiven, so we forgive. We are dearly loved, so love characterizes our fellowship. It doesn't mean that we ignore sin. We, we do well to remember that Jesus was not gentle toward everyone. He condemned hypocrisy when He saw it, and He unleashed His righteous anger when He saw that some opportunistic people were trying to make money from pilgrims who were there at the temple in Jerusalem to worship. Paul was willing to call out Peter for his lack of courage. He was willing to contend for the faith among those who had flawed theology, and he was willing to break fellowship with people when it was necessary for him to do so. He knew that certain situations compromised the integrity of the church and abandoned orthodoxy altogether. So there, there were times when Paul was willing to act decisively if it served to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We do not neglect sin. We acknowledge it, but we are willing to be gracious. And in, if, in Ephesus, Paul's hope is that this church, this beloved church, will cling so closely to the gospel that there will be meaningful, God-honoring unity there that among the rich and the poor, the locals and the immigrants, the merchants and the laborers, there would be a Christ-centered community of godly men and women who are united by something greater than the sum of their differences. And that aspiration for the Ephesian church is evident in the very next thing that Paul writes. Seven times in the final sentence of this passage, Paul uses the word one. One body, the church. One spirit, the Holy Spirit who indwells the church one hope in the gospel, one Lord Jesus Christ who reigns over all, one faith, one baptism, one God who is over all and through all and in all. That repetition is the Bible's way of trying to get your attention. It's like a flashing light. Paul really wants this point to sink in. There are not different baptisms for the rich and for the poor. There is not a different spirit 
for people who were born in Ephesus than the Spirit for those who were born in Egypt or India or wherever, wherever else people in this Ephesian church are from. There is not a different Savior. There is not a different gospel. There is not a different God. He is over all and through all and in all, so His church is one because they cling to one gospel, one Savior, one Spirit. They have one baptism, and they worship one God. And the members of that church have something greater in common than whatever it was that used to divide them from one another or might tempt them to divide in the future. It's like if two kids went to rival high schools. They played against each other in sports for years and years, and at times when they clashed on the basketball court, tensions ran high. They spent years thinking of each other as adversaries, and the idea that they could ever become friends was just beyond implausible to them. But then, if after high school, they both joined the military and wound up fighting together on the other side of the world together, those old rivalries would seem so trivial to them all of a sudden. The things that once divided them from one another would pale in comparison to the brotherhood that they now share, and one of them would willingly lay down his life for the other. In the fellowship of God's people, the cultural boundaries that have been overcome are so much greater, and the union formed is so much more substantial. The sin that has been forgiven is great, so the joy of the community of the recipients of that grace is the tie that binds believers together and enables them to express that grace in their relationships. To lose that unity is to lose the gospel altogether. First John explains that anyone who claims to know God, who identifies as a believer, yet hates his brother in the church, does not really believe at all. He says, whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because darkness has blinded his eyes. If we neglect the fellowship of God's people, if we don't care about the joys and sorrows of our brothers and sisters in faith, it reveals how little we know about God's own care for our joys and sorrows. If we remain bitter and proud and resentful toward one another, it shows that we have never really known the degree to which we ourselves have been shown kindness and mercy by one who would have been justified in his anger toward us. So Paul wants believers in Ephesus and elsewhere to strive to maintain the unity of the body of Christ with the same eagerness that they would preserve the wholeness of their actual physical body. Someone who loses a limb or even just a finger does not do so casually or without regret. We all do our best at the end of every day to finish the day with the same number of body parts we had when we started it. If we fall short of that goal, it is a big deal. We are naturally eager to maintain the unity of our bodies, and Paul wants us to think that way about the body of Christ which we are part of. We should eagerly seek the preservation of the unity established when God called His people into this body of faith. It is and it must be a priority for all of God's people because friendships are formed by the common joy in Christ, and those friendships are one of the ways that we comprehend God's love for us. In the humble, patient ways that we deal with one another, we behold the love of God. We glimpse something of the truth of God's love in His humbleness and His patience toward us, and we treasure Christ more. In forgiving and being forgiven by brothers and sisters in this room, we deepen our appreciation of the joy and forgiveness that we have received from God, and it is one of the ways that the world around us will see the love of God. Jesus explained to his disciples that it is by this you will, the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So at Westgate, it is one of our core commitments, one of the things that defines our objectives as a church family. We don't want to think of ourselves as just a group of people who generally get along and like hanging out together, even though I hope that's true. We know that we have more in common than something that is as trivial as social status or hobbies or common career paths. Those things can be the basis 
for good and meaningful friendships. But what God has established in the church is a family. In the manner most worthy of our calling, God's calling to us to rise from the death of sin and receive new life. The manner most worthy of our calling is to love because we have been loved. To show grace because we have been shown grace and to treasure Christ together as a unified people. As we close the sermon this morning, we reaffirm our commitment to Christ-centered community. Officially, our core commitment says this, what unites the church is not our common interests, age, ethnicity, financial status, or stage of life. What unites us is our common faith in Jesus Christ, who has made us one through the cross and resurrection. Therefore, we're committed to sharing life as a family, growing in Christ together, and enjoying fellowship in the gospel and for the gospel. We want to nurture a community that is marked by warmth, hospitality, honesty, laughter, and grace as we look into God's word, talk about life, and pray together in our pursuit to treasure Christ above all things. My hope for you this morning, for all of us, is that we will leave this place thinking about the way that God's love for us, expressed in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, shapes the way that we live our lives, and it shapes the way we think about one another in the body of Christ here at Westgate Church. That we would value the gift of fellowship that God has given us as something to bless us by nurturing our faith and reminding us of the heart of Christ, Christ, and that we would experience that in our fellowship. May we eagerly maintain the unity of the body of Christ together. Let's pray. God, as we think about what it means that we have been forgiven and loved by you despite our sin, we are humbled. Help us to become a local church that embodies the promise and the hope of the gospel, and that in this community you would give us the chance to see your love for us even more clearly. We ask that you would bless and sustain our fellowship by uniting us under the lordship and loving mercy of your Son, and we pray these things in his name. Amen.